Welcome back to the podcast. Ernest, how are you doing today? Doing well. You debuted on television this morning. Why don't you tell everybody about that experience and uh, what you learned from doing live television? Hot mic. Yes. So it was the first time I was ever on BNN. I was on the street mm -hmm. uh, at 8.30 a.m. And to be honest, I was super nervous before it started. Couldn't really sleep the night before. Yeah. But then as I went on, uh, it was it was a... It was, it was just like talking on a podcast, exactly. just, just talking about stocks. And I think it went pretty well. Well, I watched you and hopefully some of our clients also did. Well, definitely your your father was watching and your maybe your wife, was your wife watching? Yes, she watched with the kids. Okay. And I, I think my kids thought I was going to play Minecraft on, or something okay. like that. <laughs> they don't really. <laughs> yeah, well, ne uh, cable TV, network TV is is not something that kids watch anymore, right? And certainly my kids only watch, I guess, the Raptors or some kind of sports. But aside from that, it's all streaming or YouTube stuff, right? Things are really changing. And I just found out uh, right before the show mm -hmm. that Andy Jassy, CEO of Amazon, like he was going on on CNBC at... Yeah. 8.30 at the exact same time that I was going to make Fair enough. Debut. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't know how many people ended up watching my segment, yeah. but like I... Well, I don't think the BNN Bloomberg viewership is that high anyways to begin with. I One of the things that we've read is that the network cable ratings have gone down significantly over the last few years. One of the reasons why they were up was COVID and following what was going on with the news day, day to day and possibly Donald Trump being president. That was newsworthy. There's less newsworthy things. Also, when the market is quite strong, people don't really tune into business news as much as they do when the market is volatile or bad things are happening. People like bad news. Makes us feel good. I don't know why, but we like watching and hearing bad news. And uh, that brings up the ratings. Yeah, and sometimes on on the media mm -hmm. i feel like they like to make a big thing a big deal out of every little thing that happens yes. in the markets mm -hmm. right so there was a good tweet that i saw where basically the, the 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 person was saying it seems like the fate of the universe is deciding whether inflation was 10 bips higher or lower than consensus yeah it's all ridiculous right yeah um when i mean like there's so much noise in these figures like mm -hmm. Not, not to say who cares, but like it, it's, it, it's so immaterial in the grand scheme of things. But we need, especially when it comes to business news, we need something to talk about to determine what is moving the markets, right? They all, we, we always want to know, okay, we had a bad day. Why did we have a bad day? Is, is, is that mean tomorrow is going to be another bad day? And is this the top? We always see a lot of people on FinTwits, on Twitter, uh, when stocks do well, they say, well, this is the top. That's it. It's done. We're never going to go higher again, which is just, just mindless stupidity. But I guess it depends which type of investor you are, right? Uh, you and I were talking this morning about when you look at the list or universe of great investors over the years, like the best of the best, Warren Buffett or Bill Miller or Bill Ackman, there's really not that many super wonderful investors. Everybody else is really just not, they're not, I mean, hedge fund guys, are they investors or are they traders? I, it's hard to rectify it in your brain. Right. It's like, yeah. it, to some extent, it's like being an athlete, mm -hmm. right? Like there are players who can have a great season or two, right? And then they kind of fade away and, and nobody remembers who they are. Yeah. But you know, to have a track record that lasts for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. like that's really, really hard. And that it proves that you're able to na navigate through the various market cycles mm -hmm. that you are able to survive, as we've seen. Yeah. Like there were a lot of investors in, in 2021, for example, that I think everybody was saying that, you remember when, Pete, when Chamath was saying he was the next Buffett? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then like, I don't know if he's, as relevant today as he was back then. Mm. Um, and so I, I really think that that's a great point, that yeah. that um, there just aren't that many great investors. It really gives you an interesting perspective on what it means to be a great investor, like a Warren Buffett. And, and it really comes down to making yourself invincible over all different types of market 
uh, movements. And that's what Buffett has achieved. He's managed to survive because he's never been killed by one bad market or one bad investment over the years. He's managed to navigate, as you said, the, the uncharted waters of what's going to happen and stick with really uh, the same philosophy for a very long period of time and still going. Unbelievable. He's going to be night. So uh, the annual meetings come up in a few weeks. I mean, it's just the guy's on incredible. And uh, so, but let's getting back to uh, the, the business media. You talked about on TV this morning about Canadian companies that um, are undervalued compared to some of their U.S. counterparts and with the potential of the Canadian dollar weakening against the U.S. dollar because it's clear from the data that the Canadian economy is not as strong as the U.S. economy. So I'm really taking the words out of your mouth because this is your thesis. So why don't you get into it, Ernest? Well, I, th I think people who listen to this podcast and follow Barry and myself uh, for a long time would know that we, we don't try and time macro. We, we try to avoid uh, predicting these kind of things because it's better to focus on the company fundamentals. Mm -hmm. You want to find businesses that you know, can make money and grow their business regardless of the macro situation. Now, with that being said, the reason that I had to talk a little bit about rates and currency and those kinds of things on TV is because that was the topic of the day. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, you saw stocks fell because inflation was higher than expected in the U.S. And we also had the Bank of Canada announcement that it's not cutting rates in April, but it's leaving the door open for rate cuts potentially by this summer. So, uh, whereas the U.S., it doesn't look like there's any chance of rate cuts this summer. No, I think these things are, are, are still important to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And especially so because they can create buying opportunities. Yeah, if you're a short-term investor, if you're trading each and every day or, or trying to know which stock is going to do well in the next few weeks, these things are the most important things. But the point we're going to make is if you're like us who – when we want to hold an investment for a long period of time, these things are meaningless to our strategy and our thesis. And to the extent that we think that the Canadian dollar might fall over the next year, mm -hmm. right? It's not that we're buying uh, U.S. stocks because we think that the Canadian dollar is going to be weak. Yeah, you would do that, I guess, if you thought, if you had a one-year time horizon. Yes. Yeah. But what, what, this, what, what actually is happening is that investors generally have a low sentiment. Uh, uh, Canadian stocks are out of favor. They're not buying Canadian stocks. So why are they out of favor? They're, they're out of favor because the Canadian economy is not expected to be good. Mm -hmm. And so... Isn't it also, Ernest, um, just the fact that in Canada, we're missing some of those sectors that have been providing tremendous growth that the U.S. has, like exactly. big tech? Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, like... We only have Shopify, basically, yeah. for big tech. And right. Shopify has actually done very well in the last 15, 16 months, uh, riding that big tech wave. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the core of my thesis, uh, to get to the end of it, yeah. is that because the, the, the TSX and Canadian stocks overall are, are, are not performing very well, you are able to buy these high-quality Canadian compounders mm -hmm. at more attractive prices than what they would be if they were trading in the U.S. And, and for those newish viewers, please reiterate what we mean by high quality and and compounders as well. So uh, yeah. high quality businesses like these are these are good businesses that have strong market position. They make a lot of money. They have, have good growth opportunities. They maybe have done a good job at doing acquisitions in the past. Mm -hmm. And so one example that I gave was Alimentacion Couche Tart, mm -hmm. the convenience store chain. We talked about them on the last episode. On the last podcast you and I did together yes. called uh, Something Strange is a Foot or Compound. Sorry, that's the Bill and Ted uh, movie, but uh, Compounding is a Foot at the Circle K. Check it yes. out. I yeah. won't uh, reiterate the entire thesis here, yeah. but the the... They've done a terrific job of consolidating the convenience store industry globally. Mm -hmm. It's not just a Canadian company. That's right. More, their, more of the assets that they own are outside Canada. Right. And as a Canadian company listed only on the Toronto Stock Exchange, uh, with the Canadian dollar dropping against the U.S. dollar, is that a benefit for Couche Tard? 
they benefit slightly from an FX translation perspective mm-hmm. because they're earning euros and US dollars and all these other currencies. Right? Which are stronger against the Canadian yeah. dollar. Okay. So they're making a little bit more relative to the stock, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? But I think um, more importantly is that I think because it's trading on the TSX yeah. and not listed anywhere else, it's trading at a discount to what it would be if it was probably trading, if, if it was listed in the US. So uh, by comp- one example, like Casey's General, yeah. they, they operate convenience stores and they have a weird model where they sell pizza together with their convenience stores. But um, it's the fifth biggest pizza chain in North in uh, the United States, I believe, Casey's. Yes. Yeah. But very similar business in, in the end. Like yeah. They sell fuel. They sell they have convenience stores. Yeah. Do you know like Kushtard, by the way, is the number one seller of hot dogs? Circle K is the number one seller of hot dog and it's in North America. So yeah. Is that this true? Is, this is a bit of a side note. Okay. Like we're, we're getting off topic here. I know. But well, no, we but, always do no, this. We're getting yeah. off topic. Yeah. But yeah. I think a generally good rule of thumb for an investment mm-hmm. is how many hot dogs they sell. Yeah. Because 7 Eleven and Circle K sell a ton of hot dogs. Yeah. Costco sells a ton of hot I've dogs. I've never had a hot dog at uh, 7-Eleven or Circle K. Have you? No. I don't I like haven't. hot dogs to begin with, but anyways, that's oh. getting more off topic. <laughs> yeah, Costco <laughs> sells a ton of hot dogs. Yes, of course, 100%. And People love that buck fifty hot dog and soda combo. It's it's unbelievable. IKEA is not a public company, yeah. but very successful business. They sell a ton of hot dogs. At like a bargain don't they sell more price. meatballs than hot dogs? Well, I think yeah. they sell a lot of hot dogs yeah. as well. Okay. So, I didn't know there's such a thing as Swedish hot dogs. Okay. So yeah. if you find a business that uses hot dogs to drive sales, it's hmm. probably buy the stock. Hmm. Baskin Wealth hot dogs. You're getting me interested here. Okay. Anyways, back, yeah. okay. back to the topic though. Okay. K- Casey's General, very similar business to Kushtard. Trades at twenty four times earnings, right? Okay. Uh, that seems that seems pricey. Kushtar trades at seventeen times earnings. Okay. And I have no hesitation in saying if it was a U.S. company, yeah, exact same business, it would trade at a much closer multiple to Casey's. Fair. Right? Mm-hmm. Interesting. So that's one example. Yeah, and and Kushtard, it's not. This is not a brand new company. This has a track record of delivering strong results for. Th- you know, 30, 30 plus years. Right. Yeah. These are, this is a widely recognized, at least in Canada, yeah. as a compounder. And what holds back the valuation? From what I've seen is there are a number of fund managers or hedge funds or what have you that have mandates where they say they don't only stick to U.S. businesses. They won't buy a, uh, a business on another exchange or a foreign company like an alimentation goose chart, which is funny calling it a foreign company when it reports all of its uh, metrics in U.S. dollars and generates most of its revenues in U.S. dollars, but it's a foreign company because it's not listed on any U.S. exchanges. And as a result, less, fewer buyers, maybe uh, a lower valuation. And I think this is true not just from a from an active fund yeah. perspective. So, like, ex- like yes, institutional mandates. If you have a mandate to buy U.S. stocks, mm-hmm. then you can't buy this company yeah. because it's listed in Canada. Seems but, dumb. Seems dumb, but that's the rules. Yeah. But that's also true for passive indexes. Mm-hmm. So, like things like ETFs, yeah. right? Again, uh, and even if it was listed in the U.S., right, it, it, it is considered a Canadian company. It wouldn't be included in the S and P five hundred, so you would not have all the buying that comes from yeah. you know being part of that index. And Kushtard is no joke. It's a it's a close to sixty billion U S dollar market cap, much bigger than Casey's. Yeah, um, probably the largest publicly traded convenience store in the world, or close well, Seven Eleven, Seven Eleven, but yes, but North America for sure. Yes, and yet no recognition for that. And okay, so th- that's a good uh, good example. Are, do you have any other examples that you you talked about this morning uh, on TV that uh, is very in the very similar uh, thesis? Yeah, another one is CCL Industries. It's the we larger, also we also did a podcast on that one. Yeah, largest mm-hmm. label maker in the world. Again, terrific track record of making acquisitions. Yeah. The stock price is not as smooth as Kushtard. It was smooth. It was yeah. one of the top compounders. Up until I would say pre-COVID, uh, when when things kind of fell apart after. But I yeah. think from a like a thesis and corporate governance perspective, mm-hmm. very similar because you have a controlling shareholder. They own a lot of stock still. 
you have a CEO who has done a terrific job of creating value in place, right? And CCO industry trades at 17 times earnings. Okay. It's up a, it's, it, it was lower, but it's now 17 times earnings. Mm -hmm. Avery Dennison, which is a, a very comparable company in yeah. the US, mm -hmm. they also make labels and tape and all that, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It trades for 24 times earnings, right? So again, another example where a Canadian company, probably just by virtue of it being in trading in Canada, is at a discount to a US peer. Mm -hmm. But this is, so this is a well-known uh, thesis, of course, where Canadian companies trapped in Canada on the exchanges don't get any U.S. love. Have, has there ever been uh, times when Canadian companies have traded at a premium to U.S. companies? I guess we could name a few. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think that uh, it's not, I wouldn't say, yes, there are certainly companies that I, I think where the effect is the opposite. Yeah. It's Dollarama, like, for do example. Dollarama is the, the best example of that, mm -hmm. where because there are so few quality companies in Canada, yeah. it trades at such a high premium because you kind of have to own it, yeah. right? You saw this with Shopify in 2021, mm -hmm. where if you wanted tech, you had to own Shopify. What else could, because if you were running a Canadian mandate, yeah. what else would you buy? Exactly. And so, yeah, Dollarama is one where trades at a materially higher valuation than other dollar stores in the US, Yeah, right? I think Constellation Software is kind of a unique business. It is unique. Some may compare it to a US company called Tyler Technologies, which is uh, similar in the sense that it has a vertical software- yes, for uh, governments. For governments. And it seems to trade at a material higher valuation than, than Constellation. But one may say that because it is exposed more to government, it's maybe a better business. I don't know. Yes. Or may have higher organic revenue growth than Constellation. Yeah. And to be clear, yeah. our thesis on Kushtard and CCL is not that they will achieve the valuations that their peers in the mm -hmm. US are getting, mm -hmm. right? The point is that these are great businesses that are going to comp continue to grow their cash flows and and, and make acquisitions over time. It, it kind of doesn't matter what the valuation what what the valuation is today relative to the U.S. peer because as long as they continue to do what they do, the That's share right. price should continue to go up over time. I think trading at a discount to your peers would matter if there's a potential for your company to be taken over, yeah. right? If uh, private equity or a larger peer wants to acquire you. That kind of can't happen with Kushtard or Constellation Software or even CCL Industries all have major insider ownership and they would probably block any deal unless it was done at a, a great uh, premium. I don't think Constellation's ever selling anyways. Well, Constellation is, is such a big company now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, would, I don't know who would even have the resources to acquire it. And, and so the final... Uh, company that you talked about this morning was um, Canadian Natural Resources. Yes. Um, and so why don't you finish off on that one? So Canadian Natural Resources, unlike the other two, um, they would directly benefit from a strong, uh, a weak Canadian dollar because 40% 40 40 or so of their production is sold at, first of all, it's, it's upgraded into what we call synthetic crude oil. Okay. And this is a very high quality crude that is sold at US benchmark pricing. So to the extent that you know, US dollar is strong, they're actually making more money, right? They're yeah. actually selling, they're, they're, they're producing in Canada, they're, they're able to sell it at a higher premium in the and US. And for all intents and purposes, it's, it's like uh, sweet crude that is drilled yes. by US uh, oil companies. Yes. And even though it's a synthetic based one yes. because of the oil sands, got it, yeah. And so, Another company that, despite its very, very strong stock performance over the last year or so. Over the last five years, the stock is almost up 200%. I think still very reasonably valued mm -hmm. um, where it is today. If you look at it on any valuation metric, yeah. both uh, like, like PE, like price to reserve ratio, um, relative to major US and European oil companies, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not expensive. Yeah. The, the holdback on the Canadian oil sands companies was always that they were getting a discount on the oil that they were selling, and um, that's worth less, as well as maybe the worries about ESG 
in Canada, the amount of uh, climate emissions that the oil sands are producing. I mean, you can come up with a whole host of reasons why the Canadian oil sands were trading at a discount, yet no one would ever say, well, these guys have so much in reserve, right? Canadian Natural, what, what, what is their proven developed, uh, proven re reserves, like over 30 years? Yes. Yeah. And potential reserves of 70 years? Yeah. Like, this is insane. Whereas a U.S. oil major, like an Chevron or an Exxon, uh, getting off topic here, by the way, did you know that all those companies, Exxon and Chevron, were from the breakup of Standard Oil? And they're fighting over, I think, Guyana right now. Yeah, they're all fighting. I mean, they all used to be one company talking about uh, monopolies and, and big tech. Um, it's Even if you break these companies up, they still survive. It's not like they go out of business. Yeah, okay. So... Uh, yeah, that was the last example. Yeah, that, that was the last Canadian example. Canadian natural resources. And I can go on. Like, yeah. There's, there's more examples. Keep, keep going. Like TFI International. Yeah. Another one, another Canadian company, trucking business, trades at a discount to uh, other trucking peers in the US. Mm -hmm. Like you could say, yeah, it's a diff bit of a different business. It's not totally apples to apples. Yeah. But point still stays. Well, there's a SIA and Old Dominion in the US that trade at very hefty mul multiples of earnings, 30 times earnings. And you look at TFI International it has potential uh, to do uh, close to $10 a share in earnings, maybe not this year, but next year, and, and trading at almost half the valuation of some of those exactly. uh, well-run uh, trucking businesses in the US. What about a company that we don't own like CGI? Uh, also Canadian, I think it's only Canadian listed. It might be listed on the US, but you know, Canadian company, you, one could compare that, I guess, to an Accenture or another type of consulting yep. company. So there's no end to the names that you can find. But then you have to do the research, right? Just because it's trading at a discount to a U.S. peer, maybe it's deserves to trade a discount. Maybe it's not right. as good a business. Right. Uh, or maybe they deserve to trade at a premium like a Dollarama. You can't compare Dollarama to the U.S. dollar stores, which are not you know, the U.S. dollar stores are mostly selling food items at, at discounts, whereas Dollarama is, you know, has a grab bag of everything and very good pricing power. So it's it's not always an apples to apples comparison. But uh, I think the point, the final point you made uh, this morning is we're still more focused on owning U.S. companies. Any, yes. any change to that thesis no, this I, year? Um, no, I would say there is it's not really at yeah. the end of the day. What, if you want to own the best businesses, right? The, 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 I think most of them are really in the U.S. Yeah, and just because the Canadian dollar is up or down a little bit more, right, doesn't change that, right? Um, like Costco, for example, like Costco reported seven percent traffic growth yeah. uh, in the month of say April or March. Yeah, yeah, no, it should be March. It should be March. Yes, yeah, because we're in April. Yes, now. but. Yeah, they report 7% traffic growth, which is crazy if you yeah. think about it for Costco, right? Like growing traffic 7%. I don't even understand it. And one of the other things I, I saw about Costco is its online sales were up 28% year over year. Is Costco becoming Amazon? Like why? What's going on there? Explain the 28% growth in e-commerce. Well, that was off of a very, very weak e-commerce year last year. Got it. Because you have to keep in mind that Costco's uh, e-commerce business is largely focused on things like appliances mm -hmm. and TVs that you're not going to the, the, the Costco to pick up and put into your van. Absolutely not. Right? Yeah. That's why they that's one of the reasons why they're building out this business mm -hmm. is because they can expand their selection of products to things that they they, they, they currently don't offer. Yeah. And so yeah, I think they were experiencing some of the same trends that other retailers saw mm -hmm. in, in 2021 and 2020, early 2022, when interest rates were low and people borrowed to renovate their houses and buy all new appliances. Yep. And then they were done. Yep. And then they yep. were done. And so e-commerce was very weak last year. Mm -hmm. And then now it's coming back. Yeah. So just to finish off, um, we've seen a, a renaissance earnest in some of the underperforming big techs. Uh, Amazon and Google are now at the top of the charts versus uh, worries a few years ago that uh, they were going to lose out on AI or they were going to lose out on, um, you know, Amazon's not profitable. It's never going to generate free cash flow. Google, um, you know, chat GPT and all these other things are definitely going to eat its market share. Uh, anything that we can learn <laughs> that you can learn uh, that you've learned from those, 
you know, from the movements of the, not just the movements of the stocks, but, um, you know, what's changed in the last year or so? Well, first of all, I'm not really sure that the rebound in share prices of some of the big techs that you mentioned yeah. are related to AI. Yeah. I think that a lot of it is simply macro. Like the U.S. economy remains strong. If you remember for the cloud providers, there was the what they called the optimization cycle mm -hmm. of, of cloud spending. That seems to be ending its course. So I think commercial bookings are starting to increase. Yeah, I, where I was going, where I was leading you is the earnings reports for the third quarter and fourth quarter for big techs, most of them, maybe Apple because it's you know not as uh, it's still going for a re refresh cycle were tremendous and they were showing an acceleration of demand and really AI hadn't even kicked in yet right yeah yeah so th that's the point that yeah. uh, that's the point mm -hmm. which is that I think a large portion of the the share price rebound was just improvement in the economy yeah so Andy Jassy the CEO of Amazon um, he was on TV same time as Ernest stole your thunder man but uh, at the same time they released his annual letter uh, Andy Jassy when he became CEO when Jeff Bezos left he kind of inherited the company at a rocky time and the performance of the stock under his uh, guidance was not so good up until the last few months when the stock has skyrocketed now at an all-time high. Um, you, you skimmed the letter this morning. Any thoughts on that? It's now a lar quite a large holding for us and our clients. And, and any thoughts about Andy, how An Andy Jassy is doing as a CEO? Well, when you have a... It's tough when you are following such a revolutionary CEO, mm -hmm. such as Bezos. Oh, unbelievable. Right. You saw this with like Tim Cook yeah. uh, when he was following Steve Jobs' death. I think naturally people are going to wonder if you can just, if you, if you simply are able to carry the torch from, uh, from your, your predecessor. We're, I mean, I hate to say it, but one day we're going to see what happens with Berkshire Hathaway under yeah. Greg Abel, Abel, right? He'll be yeah. running the show. Yeah. Now, with that being said, I think that the letter today, uh, I encourage you all to read it if you have a chance. Super well-written letter, right? In it, he's talking about why Amazon is able to succeed the way it does. And it's, it's because Amazon is building on these, what he calls primitives. He has the building blocks of all the services that Amazon is offering. And he's able to, by being able to focus on these primitives, He's able to, Amazon is able to act in a much more nimble way mm -hmm. to offer the products and services in that, that they want to go into. So all this money that Amazon spent over the years building out its logistics network, building out its cloud services, building out its e-commerce, it's finally coming together. Yes, and the yeah. reason why I thought it was a good letter mm -hmm. is that I thought, I think it, simultaneously reinforce the growth opportunity for Amazon while kind of dispelling some certain narratives that exist for yeah. the business. Growth opportunities, I think I think everybody kind of knows them, right? Like, yeah, they're, they're investing in things like logistics, they're opening them up, there's buy with Prime, yeah. there is uh, Prime Video, Prime Video yeah. all these kinds of things, right? But then underneath all of this is the fact that there's a lot of questions about Amazon's competitive position. Mm -hmm. In the retail business, you have Timu, right? Yeah. Like the Timu has been kind of viewed as an Amazon disruptor. And right? what about Sheen? Sheen, right? Yeah. And then in in cloud services, right? There's a question whether they are losing market share to Microsoft. Yeah. Right. And I think one thing that the letter did really well was underpinning the fact that because Amazon has the foundation. It's, it's not just about having the top layer, uh, easy buying, easy, uh, like an app that allows you to buy easily. Right? Yeah. It's about having the foundation that allows you to uh, innovate and move into the direction that the consumer wants. One of the things that was so interesting to me is Amazon is now starting to work with really top brands, right? And so Estee Lauder. Clinique, yes. uh, you know, you go down the list. Not, isn't Nike now selling through Amazon? Yes. Yeah, I mean, so there's all these major brands that want to partner with Amazon. They don't want to partner with Timu, come on, right? They want to yes. partner with the people that have the best infrastructure. And so by with, with AI, by spending on logistics, 
uh, Amazon is uh, it, 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 it's a clear winner. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. think I think that um, one of the things that I thought was it's always been kind of silly to me that people thought Timu was going to disrupt Amazon. Yeah, um, I don't know if our listeners even know what Timu is. No, why don't you tell them quickly what it is? Timu yeah. is an app. It's built by a Chinese company. It's basically like a dollar store, like with some game features. You can buy like stuffed toys. You can buy like shoes. You can buy for like very cheap clothes for yeah. very low prices, and they'll ship it to you. It takes like two weeks, but then um, it's kind of like a shopping with game game functions. It's kind mm -hmm. of edgy. They bought Super Bowl ads. Right? Not, uh, so anybody who bought their Eclipse glasses from Timu are probably still waiting for them to come. Yeah. And then you're going to maybe you'll be lucky to use them for the 2045 eclipse. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all we have for you this week. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in and we'll see you back here real soon.